see, I'm seeing. Sorry, I love you. I love you. I love Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. What is left of the political left has seen voters across the Western world look to new parties and leaders. Does liberalism and today's liberals have any answers to the problems we face? Or are they the problem? Cross-talking the political left, I'm joined by my guest John Lachlan in Paris. He is the director of studies at the Institute of Democracy and Cooperation. In Amsterdam, we have Case van der Peel. He is a fellow of the Center for Global Political Economy at University of Sussex. And in Montgomery, we cross to Jeff Dice. He is president of Mises Institute. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Uh, John Lachlan, if I can go to you first in Paris. We have a number of elections looming all across Europe. Uh, they're very, very important. They're telling us the direction of where voters are going. And, you know, and, and looking at what happened with Brexit, looking what happened in the United States with Trump here, uh, of course, the left has a lot of reasons to blame uh, for, or, or even the right have to blame for their own demise. Um, but I don't, they're not in touch with the voters, and they're not listening to the voters. And I don't see a whole lot of introspection. And I see the traditional left that championed the working class, the, the, the disadvantaged. I, I, I just see they're so hollowed <laughs> out right now. And I think it's created a huge vacuum in the political spectrum. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, let's not forget that in Britain, for example, uh, the Conservatives under Mrs. Thatcher attracted a very significant section of the working class electorate and deprived Labour of many of its traditional votes. So we have to go back a few decades to see this, uh, the beginning of this process. I also think that there's much too much talk about uh, far right and extreme right, and there's much too much head scratching about the rise of parties like the National Front in France and the uh, Freedom Party in the Netherlands. Uh, what has happened, in fact, uh, is not that these parties have risen. It's instead that the centre of gravity right. uh, across Western Europe has shifted inexorably to the left. When I say to the left, I'm not referring, to, of course, to old-style socialism, which indeed has been abandoned. I'm referring instead to that body of uh, liberal left-wing opinion, which believes in the end of the nation-state, which believes yeah. in progress and progressivism and so on. Uh, and, and which is daily uh, uh, fighting and winning new battles on, on completely unexpected things like uh, transgender and gay marriage and all the rest of it. The, the, the center of gravity having moved to the left and the political class having become increasingly dominated not by any relationship to reality, uh, but instead increasingly by ideology, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, voters feel alienated and they feel alienated precisely because of this ideology uh, which dominates and which means that political decisions are taken not with respect to reality, not with any desire to influence reality or, re or to react to it, but instead within the self-referential terms of the ideology of left liberalism. So political decisions are taken to justify, even on a symbolic level, um, uh, the, the ideology to which these people um, uh, apply. And that's why in my own articles I've increasingly said that uh, politicians, including the yeah. famous Brussels uh, bureaucrats, are not politicians or bureaucrats or technocrats. They are instead a kind of clergy engaged in a series of symbolic acts which have meaning for them, yep. but which have, don't, don't have any meaning outside their point of reference and certainly not to increasing, an increasing number of voters. Jeff, let me go to you in Montgomery because, you know, John Lachlan, I think, is on to something because I think what we have also going on right now is a, is a crisis of terminology, a crisis of lexicon, because you can look at political parties that are hovering around power. They're more interested in power than representation. They're more interested in ideology than the, 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 uh, the will of the voters. Um, and, of course, it's crashing what conservative and liberal really mean. I mean, I, I really think that we have a crisis of lexicon. Go ahead, Jeff, in, in Montgomery. Well, I think that's true, and I think that the left in the U.S. is a very different animal than the left sure, in, sure. in various European countries. But when John, when John mentions clergy, I think that's correct, because I think what we're talking about here is, is a faith. 
We're talking about a faith in neoliberalism that doesn't necessarily match the facts. And, and I do think that the old left-right paradigms are breaking down. He mentioned Margaret Thatcher stealing votes away from labor. Well, Donald Trump did the same yep. thing in the United States by taking blue-collar, working-class votes away from Democrats. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves, I think, a question, which is, what does that blue-collar union truck driver in a state like New Jersey, who likes yep. American football and, and, and beer, what does he really have in common with a left-wing professor uh, of, of feminism at Berkeley? What does he really have in common with a nonprofit ideologue at a place like Sierra Club? And the answer might be not much. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think we're reaching a point where, where, where populism is, is a healthy thing. I think when, when elites become corrupt and when they become corrupt by virtue of their relationship with sort of a state and, and finance nexus, then I think anti-elitism or populism can, can be healthy and warranted. You know, the case, you know, you, uh, uh, we could also see the example, uh, I, I'll use the example of the United States here, is that, you know, if you have the Republicans and the Democrats, again, you have these elites, and then they have these party labels on them. But you can look at a lot of the elites in both parties, particularly the Democratic one, that are obstructing Trump every step of the way, irrespective of how you feel about Donald Trump. But you, you have Republicans that are just as obstructionist in many ways as well, because they're not representing their party, they're representing their interests inside this, and we're going to use this word again that John gave us, this clergy, and I would call it a clergy of ideology and power. Go ahead, Case. Well, I, I, I would be a bit more specific. I mean, of course, it's good as an opener to, to start talking about the clergy, but the people who keep uh, the Trump administration hostage in the United States are not a clergy. They are acting for very specific interests. And I would say the interests are those of the military industrial complex sure, and, the, sure. and the forces that want the United States to intervene all across the world. So um, also, uh, if, if I may, uh, saying that, that the voters are moving to the left is not what I see. Um, well, beginning here in Holland, which is easiest for me, uh, the voters are moving to the right not all of them to uh, to Wilders and his anti-Islam uh, party, but uh, the other parties are also adopting th that language. You know, the xenophobia, uh, fear of 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 the foreign, and uh, yeah, of course, at the same time, and that was already mentioned, uh, they are ignoring. Uh, legitimate concerns of people who are faced with a massive inflow of newcomers, often not integrated and certainly without any chance of being integrated at some point in the future. Sure. You know, John, one of the things, and I think it's people can, a traditional, um, let's say, liberals, and, I, and I'm thinking of more like um, old school Democrats, you know, working class people. And, and then you can have people that are further to the right. The word progressive was brought up. And, and I can see across the board, a lot of people are very tired of identity politics because identity politics doesn't give you a job. It doesn't give you prosperity. It doesn't give you security. It gives small groups of people good Good feeling inside, okay? Nice and fluffy and warm. But it doesn't make, uh, a, in, a, in, a, in a material, physical sense, a better society. Go ahead, John. Yeah, just to uh, respond to uh, the last speaker, I didn't say that voters were moving to the left. I said that the political class and the okay. center of gravity of political debate was moving to the left. Uh, and voters, if you like, have stayed okay. where they are. Okay. So when we describe the, extreme, the rise of the extreme right, I'm, I'm implying that voters have more or less stayed where they are and the politicians have moved to the left, leaving the space open for yeah, what no, we, that's correct. in my that, view, wrongly call agree. far then right. Then I agree. Okay. But I very much, yeah, yeah, I very much agree with also with, uh, with Jeff, who, talk, who mentioned, and perhaps we can develop this point, that it's true that the left, of course, has abandoned its uh, traditional values and its traditional electorate, but the right has as well. Exactly. And I, speaking as a... As a conservative, I believe very exactly. strongly that, on balance, the left has won battle after battle in the last 25 years. Since the collapse of uh, state socialism in the Soviet Union and in its uh, satellite states in Eastern Europe, the left has not given up its basic ideology of progressivism, revolution, anti-authoritarianism and so on, anti-traditionalism. Instead, it simply transferred itself away from state socialism. Yes, so it's completely abandoned that aspect of its policy. But it hasn't under, uh, abandoned any of the underlying ideology of uh, constant revolution and constant progress. 
Indeed, to the extent that it has adopted the free market and the ideology of globalization, it has done so only because it sees in those things, as Marx himself incidentally did, uh, uh, an instrument for uh, dismantling traditional structures like yep. the nation and the family. So I see in the last, repeat, in the last 25 years since the collapse of the Soviet system, I see left and right actually converging around what is ultimately a left, a left liberalism where conservative values are basically absent or they come out in a very mangled and somehow and sometimes rather extreme way. But a, 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 a straightforward conservative party uh, does not exist in Western Europe. Jeff, weigh in on that, because oh, there are some very interesting points mentioned right there, because it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's all about how, also about how conservatism has been doing, and I would say very, very poorly. The Republican Party isn't a conservative party when I look at their leadership. Go ahead. Con conservatism, Inc., is on life support in America. Trump it, does not represent yeah, some exactly. sort of resurrection of the GOP. Exactly. On the contrary, exactly. the, the GOP is, is dead and buried when it comes to ideas, and, and deservedly so. No right. one is going to die on a hill for Ryan Care. Pro progressives have shown time and time again they will die on a hill for all kinds of things that the American public cares very little about. And, and so when you, when you, Peter, mentioned that this isn't an economic uh, left or, or a party uh, that represents populist economic blue collar interests that, that that's so true today i mean this is a party that doesn't organize in union halls it organizes in the sociology department yep. of some wretched university somewhere <laughs> it, th this is this is a left in america that that is is in has suffered has suffered a black eye with trump perhaps but this is a speed bump not a roadblock they, the, the left in the west i won't say america only controls academia, it controls okay, media, Jeff, it controls gentlemen, I'm gonna, mainstream I'm gonna religion, have, it controls I'm gonna corporate have to jump in. I'm going to have to jump in here. We have to go to a hard break. After our short break, we'll continue our discussion on the political left. Stay with RT. I see, I see. I love it. I love it. Do you see homelessness as freedom to live anywhere? If you're homeless, you can't sleep anywhere. You're not allowed. So it's just moving from spot to spot until we get kicked out. Want to leave home as a teenager and be independent from parents? Don't come running outside and be like, I'm going to be homeless. It's the cool thing. Because once you're out here, you're pretty much stuck without mommy and daddy's help. So stay at home and go to school. Returning from a war zone and expecting your country to be grateful. I just wish that this country would help veterans like me and many more out there. I see many more veterans out there in wheelchairs that have no place to live behind dumpsters. You are sure you won't ever be homeless, aren't you? They were too. Homeless people didn't come from a homeless farm. They came from parents. And so what happened to that individual? And, and what happened to that family? And what happened to those children? Why homeless? Malatya unnar kiri kiri voki. Vada mere sadari me na mere kolas jigni ani na kolas apoushe kiri jigni voki na andra gaan katni voki vada vada hoyi na. Yesma hoyi na mama vada ramano. We're in Nepal to find out why whole villages chose to sell their organs. People who haven't sold organs, or at least who haven't admitted to it, are often jealous of the help victims receive from charities. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the political left.
Okay, I'd like to go back to our guest case in Amsterdam. I consider myself very old school, and I will even say it, I consider myself a, a conservative. And what I think, when I think of politics in a normative sense, politics and politicians are supposed to resolve problems. That's what we elect them to do. I don't elect people to moralize and tell me what my values should be. And I think this is the, the speed bump. I like that from Jeff and, and Montgomery. This is a speed bump we've been hitting for decades right now. We're not solving problems. We're just told how to think about them, and usually not your own problems, but some other person's problems. Go ahead, Case. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that, uh, you know, uh, Jacques Chirac, the French politician, was once asked about the power of politics. And he said, actually, politics has no power. We are the ones who see the train go by and, and we make sure that the barriers are down on time. And, uh, you know, society was developing along, uh, you know, the entire post-war period in, in a progressive way. That there, there was work for people, there was excellent education and health care and so on and so forth. And from the late 70s, that has been uh, dismantled. Now, in, in that situation, uh, people who call themselves left, and, and we shouldn't think of that as a sort of fixed entity which I agree. always remains the same, sure. uh, uh, people who call themselves left uh, will then have to replace their ori original role, which was helping good education, good health care, and, and uh, employment uh, continue. Uh, they have to come up with something to replace it. And that, that gave us the moralizing doctrines, the, the transgender problematic, which only, you know, covers a very minor uh, slice of society, the, the gay marriage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, f all, for the people who are affected, of course, that's an important thing, perhaps, but not for society at large. And certainly it's not something that moves society as a whole in the direction of the things that I just mentioned, which we are losing. And in that sense, I think society is also moving to the right because it's in a state of stagnation, profound stagnation and crisis. You know, you know, John, if we can use the metaphor here, this is going to turn you into the program of metaphors here. But I like this, you know, keeping the trains running, making sure the barriers are all down. But what I see is I see people that call themselves conservative who are not, people who call themselves from the left who are not, they have just created one train wreck after another. And this is why people are voting in angry ways. They, they want some new solutions because what we hear is just a, a, a new tr uh, um, tread on a tire over and over again. It's retreads. Go ahead, John. Uh, Peter, if I could just uh, uh, come back to you. I think uh, Jeff's speed bump uh, metaphor was meant to imply that uh, the election of Trump is a, is a minor obstacle and will not prevent the onward march of the uh, uh, of the left. And Jeff is absolutely right. I, I st very strongly agree with this, to emphasize the extent to which the left dominates uh, the world of the media, the world of culture, sure. and so on. Sure. You know, look, we're 100 years uh, after the Russian Revolution, uh, and uh, uh, Lenin uh, thought that the way to state socialism, to socialism, was by controlling the state. Uh, but there is a far more powerful revolutionary figure whose influence uh, goes way beyond that of Lenin, and that is Antonio Gramsci, yeah. who theorized this idea yeah. that indeed the left to win had to colonize uh, the great institutions, uh, universities, schools, Culture. and so on. And you know, right. we are, and as, yeah, exactly, and yeah, as, as, yeah. as uh, I believe Andrew Breitbart used to say, uh, politics is downstream of culture. That's why, yeah. uh, Case, uh, Jack Chirac said that uh, politicians just watch the uh, train go by or watch the, watch the car caravan pass, whichever metaphor you like. It's because politics is downstream of culture. And, you know, we've observed, haven't we, uh, the collapse of the Soviet system 25 years ago. Um, what people perhaps forget in watching this spectacular historical event is that Marxism was alive and well uh, in the West, in Western universities, throughout the entire Cold War period. Right. Frank there were strong school. communist parties. Right. Uh, there were, there, exactly, there were, and, and plus there were strong pro-Soviet communist parties. So you had a vast reserve of people in the West, never mind people in the East, people in the West 
who believed in Marxism and in left-wing politics generally. And whereas in the East, nobody really believed in Marxist <laughs> ideology. I know, uh, I know. Including senior uh, <laughs> Soviet leaders. They didn't yeah. actually believe it anymore. They'd stopped believing it a long time ago. That was not true yeah. of the West. So the Soviet system having collapsed, we are now left with the inheritance of these generations of people who've been educated yep. in a broadly Marxist system. And uh, those people, yeah, uh, ed uh, educated, as I say, in those universities, those people who were young in the 1960s and who were affected by uh, the other great revolutionary, not Lenin, but John Lennon, um, <laughs> those people, of course, are now in their 60s and they have been governing us now for decades. You know, Jeff, I had the opportunity yeah, to, to live in, in Poland and in Hungary before they joined the European Union. <clears throat> and I've lived in Russia for almost 20 years. But, you know, I, I, I told Poles and Hungarians that you think your culture is important and, I, and that's your right. But you want to join a club that doesn't really care much about your culture and your values. And voila, we have two countries in the European Union that are uh, being uh, um, uh, criticized uh, severely by the clergy. I, I'm going to keep using this term and in the future. Thank you for that. Um, uh, and, and, but culture does matter. And I think this is, again, the political class is don't want to respect culture. And if you do, you're backward, you're, you're primitive, you're old-fashioned. But they're wrong and we're right. Go ahead, Jeff and Montgomery. Well, Poland will forever be a renegade for, for the simple fact that they're a religious country within yeah. the EU. This is not allowed or accepted anymore. And it's, it's interesting when John mentioned all this blathering about the far right and AFP and Garrett Wilders and Marine Le Pen as, as being white noise and nonsense. It is white noise and nonsense because the, the real authoritarians are in every public school in America. They're, they're in, in every university in America. And these are the, the, the petty uh, people on the left who would control us, who would govern us, who would restrict our speech. And, and you know, there's one thing they're right about. I don't like to call them liberals because I don't think it's a term that's earned. But, but I will say there's one thing that the left is correct about, and that is that Trump and Le Pen and Garrett Wilders, they are reactionaries. This is a reaction. Yes. Uh, the, the question is, a reaction to what? what? And, and the answer is, is a century of progressivism that has never been popular in a pure democratic sense in any Western country. This has always been imposed from the top down. It has never arisen from the bottom up. It is, it is absolutely a march through institutions. Uh, and, and people don't like it. There's still a pulse. There's still a heartbeat that says, I want transgender people to be treated well and, and to have happy lives, but I, I don't think it's, the, it's the, the momentous issue of our day where they go to the bathroom, for God's sake. And, it, and, and I think we, we've reached a point where, where left and right doesn't matter, and, and, and that heartbeat, that pulse does matter. You know, Casey, you know, you're the one that brought up the transgender issue, and I'm, I'm glad you did. And, you know, I don't want to give more time to it on this program than it deserves. But see, that's just the point, isn't it? This is what people are told to talk about, to think about, when the infrastructure of Europe is in decay, the infrastructure in the United States is in decay, and we need more space for those issues. And I will never stop talking about the need for people to have work and, and well-paid work, because that's where you get dignity. Yeah. In our society, and I don't see the political classes addressing those issues. Okay, go ahead, Case. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in 2012, Francois Hollande had, was elected on the promise that he would end austerity. He, one trip to Berlin was sufficient uh, to uh, forget about that, that promise. And uh, gay marriage was then uh, the, the compensating factor, you know. It, it was what he then had to offer. Uh, which cost him, for instance, the Muslim vote in France, which, which, he, had got, which he had won because of his promises on the economic front. Uh, what, I, what I would like to get back to, if, if I may, when John said that, uh, that uh, you know, in, in the left uh, it is still strong in universities and so on, well, I am in the university and I, I, was, I was on the left, I am on the left, but I can say that in the 1960s and 70s, our relevance was not because of our brilliant ideas, because, but be, because behind us there was a powerful working class which was unionized. Yep. Behind that was the Soviet Union with unrelated, etc. But it was
was there, and now we can have fantastic ideas and Gramsci and this and that, but there is nothing behind us, and that is why we're completely ignored and, and go along. I mean, also what I hear in this conversation is the tremendous gulf between how things are being experienced in the United States and by Americans and by people in, in Europe. I mean, here we're really moving to the right, and, that is, and there is also real conservatism in the sense that people cling to their traditional way of life, of what they think is their traditional way of life, in the face of challenges that are no longer willing to digest and which yeah. their politicians no longer uh, care for. You know, John, one thing that seems to be prevalent in all of this, again, as the United States went through an election cycle and now Europe is facing its own, um, the lack of uh, introspection on, on what has gone wrong. And I think you can anticipate what I'm going to say because um, all you do is blame Russia for it. I mean, that is one of the most pathetic reactions to not knowing what to do and not owning up to your own mistakes. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it enters uh, sort of psychiatric territory, really, doesn't it? Where uh, every single conceivable evil is projected onto Russia with no evidence whatever. I think that this uh, is uh, a, f a consequence of uh, a more general trend. Uh, when I said just now, quoting Andrew Breitbart, that politics is downstream of culture, I was referring to what I believe to be a left-wing political culture in uh, universities. But there is a more, uh, there is a cultural problem in more general terms. Uh, as education has declined, as people have fewer cultural references, fewer external cultural references, as they have fewer religious references, they just don't have the fabric, yep. uh, the intellectual or moral or spiritual fabric, uh, to, uh, to do anything other than what the herd, the political yep. herd or the political caste tells them to do. So as you have this narrowing of the cultural basis. So you have a, an ever-increasing series of John, taboos. John, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, dictate... I, I have to jump in here. Another hard break. We've run out of time, gentlemen. Many thanks to my guests in Paris, Amsterdam, and in Montgomery. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. I see. I see. I love it.